So I would like to thank you all for coming. This is a very important topic to discuss. Uh, efficiency in endocrine surgery is becoming more and more important, uh, particularly because of our increasing time demands that are being put on us by the EMR um, and because of decreasing re reimbursement. So because of this, we need to work on developing more efficiencies. Not only, um, you know, people think, oh, efficient, you know, more efficiency leads to a higher salary, but more importantly, it's to preserve our time because those extra hours we need to put into EMR things and so forth um, really take away, not from our work time, but they take away from our families, they take away from our friends, they take away uh, from our sanity. So um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I think this will be a very uh, helpful and important session. Um, uh, this session has been sponsored by Stryker. And uh, just to start out, uh, I was going to have um, Caitlin uh, Lagoni come up and uh, give a short uh, talk and a little bit of a video. Um, while uh, she's coming up uh, on the screen, uh, there's the uh, poll everywhere instructions. We're going to have a couple of questions as we're going through the talk. And so um, uh, text AAES to 22333 to join. Don't do it the opposite way. That's the way I started. So, um, but anyhow, uh, we'll ask a few questions as we're going through that deal with efficiency. Caitlin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Caitlin Lagoni, and I'm here with Stryker. We wanted to specifically call out one product that we believe can really partner with you in driving efficiency in your OR, and that product is our C2 nerve monitor. The C2 nerve monitor is used to help identify the facial and recurrent laryngeal nerve. It can help drive efficiency in two different ways. The first being an easy to use console system within your surgeries, and the second is by driving down the cost associated with nerve monitoring equipment in your procedures. Before we dig deeper into the product itself, we have a short video we'd like to play of Dr. Acevedo and how he uses the C2 nerve monitor. We'll go ahead and roll the video. Initially, I was interested in the C2 nerve monitor because it brought competitive pricing, which helped me get a nerve monitor into my institution. And after trialing it, I found that the reliability was high, the quality was high, the process was easy to use, and the support from our Stryker sales force has been really, really great. I think the main advantages as a patient with the C2 nerve monitor is improved outcomes, reliable identification of the nerve to prevent voice issues afterwards, dysphagia issues afterwards. Using the same endotracheal tube you would have used without a nerve monitor just makes it a more comfortable recovery for your patients. The way that the C2 nerve monitor has really helped in my practice is in the patient outcomes and that a more comfortable endotracheal tube that doesn't give them this really bad sore throat afterwards and for me as a surgeon having that really tight signal to noise ratio and knowing when I stimulate that nerve that's the nerve and I'm not constantly fighting to try to discern what's real versus what's not. I think value-based um, care is, is really huge in my institution now and in that you know reimbursements are getting lower the patient's exposures as far as cost is getting higher so we really have to be cognizant as a surgeon that we're providing the best possible outcomes at the lowest possible price and the C2 does that so as you can see on that video and there's some postcards in front of those that are sitting at the table we have the standard ET tube that's wrapped in the striker laryngeal electrode select it essentially transforms your standard ET tube into a nerve monitoring tube, which helps to drive down the cost associated with that nerve monitoring capital uh, in, in comparison to pre-assembled ET tubes and thyroid procedures. Secondly, the capital itself of the console system is easy to use with simplified tones, which helps to reduce the rate of false positives within your thyroid procedures. If you haven't had an opportunity already, we would love for you to swing by the Stryker booth. We're over in the exhibitor hall where we'd be happy to give a hands-on demo of the product as well. Thank you so much to the society as well as each of you as we continue to partner with you, our customers, as we're driven to make healthcare better. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. So um, I wanted to get started, uh, and we'll introduce each of the uh, um, speakers as they come up, but we would uh, like to get going just with a uh, poll in your question first. I'm sorry, can we get the first poll in your question? It's 
So the first question is about um, uh, efficiency in your office, and it's how many patients you typically see in an office day. So we can't see these up here, but I know that's what the question's all about. So fairly typical in the, uh, you know, uh, teens for uh, most patients, teens or 20s, thank you very much, uh, teens or 20s for most patients. So these people that are in the, um, you know, 30, 30 plus uh, patients per day, uh, the real question is how do they see patients and see them well? And um, so those are things that um, uh, it would be nice to uh, talk further about. Um, uh, our first speaker is uh, David Bimston. Uh, he's down in Hollywood, Florida at uh, the Memorial Center for Integrated uh, Endocrine uh, Surgery. And um, he's going to be speaking to us about a different model that uh, uh, increases your efficiency by increasing um, uh, the RVU density of what you do. David? Afternoon. Perfect. Um, so um, I guess I should start off uh, based on yesterday's discussion by saying I am an endocrine surgeon and uh, put it on my slide. Um, my practice, uh, the Memorial Center for Integrative Endocrine Surgery, is a collaborative model. Uh, it is I would say true multidisciplinary care, where an endocrine surgeon and an endocrinologist work side by side to take care of patients. It is the brainchild of um, Dr. Harrell and myself. Dr. Harrell is a, uh, an endocrinologist and an early adapter of uh, neck sonography uh, utilized by um, endocrinologists. He uh, is a past um, ACE president and um, developed endocrine, uh, an endocrine practice at the Cleveland Clinic Florida where he introduced uh, ultrasound at a time when the only people who really did ultrasound on the neck were, were radiologists. And when I came into uh, town in Fort Lauderdale in early 2000, uh, I was really disappointed with the endocrine surgery care model that I saw in the community. Uh, and I have, have two examples. So, this was the hyperparathyroidism care model that uh, was present in the community at the time. Uh, PCP would identify hypercalcemia, refer the patient to an endocrinologist. The skill level of that endocrinologist in terms of hyperparathyroid disease could be questionable. This could be a diabetologist who only 1% of their practice is anything but diabetes. That endocrinologist would almost always send the patient for a SESTA-MEB scan, which meant yet another referral usually to an outpatient radiology center or a hospital. The sesta scan was performed, usually without an ultrasound. The patient was then sent back to the endocrinologist, usually with just a report, no imaging. If the endocrinologist wanted an ultrasound, that usually meant another referral back to the radiologist for another test. The patient was then sent back to the endocrinologist who, if the patient needed surgery, would usually refer them to the original PCP who would then send the patient to the surgeon of their choice, which was often a surgeon who did gallbladders and hernias or was the, the ENT guy in the community who uh, would see all the sore throats and ear infections. So the, the, the skill level of the surgeon was also at question. And then the patient, if they were going for an operative procedure, would have an operation. Whether it was a minimally invasive procedure, a maximally invasive procedure, whether there was intraoperative parathyroid hormone testing that was available at, the, at uh, that hospital was all in question, and usually the, the endocrinologist ended up with the patient being sent back uh, from the surgeon with limited, if any, communication, and that they had to deal with what they, they found. And it was a very similar thyroid care model, where patients were referred from PCP to endocrinologist, back and forth from radiology, uh, and ultrasound and radiology that needed a fine needle aspirate clearly meant two trips to the radiologist, one for the ultrasound, one for the fine needle aspirate. Um, and you made your way through the PCP back to the surgeon. And once again, limited communication. So if it was a cancer, whether it was a hemithyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy or lymph nodes were going to be removed, who knew 
the endocrinologist had to, had to deal with what they found at that time. And uh, my entry into the, um, the South Florida community was sort of contemporaneous with this article that uh, came out in surgery looking at who was performing endocrine surgery. So it was pretty clear to me that I was not the only person who was concerned about the endocrine surgery models that existed throughout the country. And had lots of conversations with Dr. Harrell, and we identified a number of issues uh, with the present care model. Clearly there was a time issue. It would take patients weeks or months to uh, finish their workup before they went to surgery. There was a cost issue, lots of co-pays, maybe hospital fees as well, and certainly unnecessary tests that were being performed. The ultrasound reporting model was in question, unlike in my office where we do real-time ultrasound in front of the patients. Uh, these were ultrasounds that were performed by technologists, read uh, as static images by radiologists, and then sent to the endocrinologist and the surgeon who often didn't even have the images in front of them. New technologies, which at that time in South Florida, things like molecular, di uh, molecular um, diagnostic evaluation was um, being marketed not only to the endocrinologist, but also to the radiologists who really weren't sure what to do with these techniques, uh, and clearly they were not uh, ubiquitous at that time. Um, and then the overall coordination and decision making and integration of care, as you can see from my prior slides, was really in question. So we had a vision of a one-stop shopping model with clinical integration that would be efficient and cost effective. We would have a expert at uh, neck sonography and a highly specialized surgeon um, communicating not only with each other, but with the patient and the patient's family. We would have the highest quality imaging um, technology along with molecular diagnostic techniques and the newest surgical techniques. And we, we really wanted to provide patients with a clear and understandable care plan. And this really started off um, less as a um, journey of efficiency and making a, a better business model for us and more of a a journey to make a better business model for the patient. And um, we really wanted this to mean something, integration or collaboration, whatever you want to call it. We wanted it to be real, something that we, we actually did. This, this was also a time in the community where every hospital system uh, started their own multidisciplinary cancer center, which generally meant um, a radiation oncology center that made a lot of money for the hospital, but there really wasn't integration between medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists, and surgical oncologists. So it was just a marketing tool. We didn't want this to be a marketing tool. We wanted this to be uh, an actual action. And so we designed our practice around uh, an endocrinologist and an, endocrino and an endocrine surgeon working in the same physical space. So th this is exactly uh, what our uh, office looks like. Um, the patient, uh, the surgeon, the endocrinologist are all there at the same time. The patient's uh, family would be sitting off to the side that would be facing one of the uh, large panel screens. The patient uh, lying on the table can also see one of the large panel screens. And all of the discussion happens in front of the patient. So if it's my patient who I see first thing in the morning, I meet the patient, I tell them they're going to be meeting my endocrinology partner and having an ultrasound, and then when I go in with the patient to do so, I'm essentially presenting the patient's case to, the, to my partner so that they hear that we're both discussing it. We know what's going on with the patient's case. We're having discussion during the ultrasound. We're pointing things out. The family's there. They're watching. Then we discuss where we're going with this, with the patient and the family present. Um, and uh, if we get to the point that, uh, that surgery is involved, then sometimes my endocrinology partner will walk out at that point, but I think that the, the patient and the family already knows where all this is headed. And uh, this, was, this is just another one of our offices. We have, we have four offices, actually, and they're all set up in a similar fashion. This is a couple of our nurses. But we have integrated the physician, the patients, the family into the care, and it's all point-of-care communication. So from the, the standpoint of benefits, we felt that for the patient, this was true multidisciplinary care. There's lots of data about the benefits of multidisciplinary care in the surgical oncology literature and, and for endocrine surgery, it should work the same. Clearly, a much more efficient mo uh, model where patients, uh, their interactions with the doctor and their biopsies all done at the same time. 
uh, lower cost, one copay, unne no unnecessary tests, clearly a higher level of satisfaction when I spoke to the patients, and, and Mac and I believed a higher level of care. I learned over time that, that there was also a benefit to the surgeon uh, on an economic and efficiency level as well. It clearly was inf increasing my volume of um, surgical candidates because number one, not only was I getting referrals from the community, I also had a built-in referral basis, uh, a built-in referral base, and uh, it allowed me to move along much quicker in the office. I would see a patient, say we're gonna do an ultrasound, send him into the room, waiting for the endocrinologist, I'd be seeing another post-op or starting a new patient, then they'd call me when they're ready, I would go in, we'd have our conversation, we'd do our ultrasound. If a FNA was necessary, I said to the patient, okay, let's, let's move ahead with that, and I'd leave and go see my next patient or finish up with my, my second patient. While the endocrinologist was doing the biopsy, I might see them one more time real quick and say, you know, come back in a week and we'll, we'll move on from there. Um, and this meant for me more RVU-rich procedures. Uh, instead of spending my time, and you can see the RVU values uh, there, doing ultrasounds and FNA-guided uh, biopsies, I was maybe seeing a new patient for a parathyroidectomy or a, a thyroidectomy. And I will tell you that these RVU numbers are actually the good RVU numbers that just changed recently again, and the, uh, the reimbursement for thyroid ultrasound and FNA has, has dropped. Um, it was a built-in second opinion. Patients who came to me and were unsure whether their endocrinologist was jumping the gun in sending them to a surgeon, basically got a second endocrinology opi opinion, and I would point that out to them. Patients who saw a discrepancy between what their endocrinologist was recommending and what I was recommending, I was once again validated by my partner. And I also benefited from um, um, optimization as well, uh, in that if I had patients who had diabetes and the like, my partner would take care of that too. Um, there was clearly a benefit to the endocrinologist. Uh, they were involved in the active decision making about what procedure was going to be performed. Increased workload, they were not only getting their referrals, but I was feeding them with the referrals. Clearly a much better case mix in that uh, they were able to see uh, a lot more of the patients that interested them. And it turned out to be a, an improved business model because it was easier for them to sell themselves to the hospital when we, when we moved on to our next step, which I will talk about. From the hospital standpoint, they loved us when we came and, and described this model to them and explained to them what we were planning to put together. This was a time where centers of excellence uh, were becoming more prevalent. Satisfaction scores, CG cap, each cap score, that very important. Overall improved outcomes uh, because we were moving towards quality-based payment. Uh, they were happy to have a, uh, a team of doctors that suggested they would provide them with a higher level of care. And there were some initial concerns uh, that our referral base would stop um, uh, referring to us if I worked with an endocrinologist. There were financial hurdles like, what about the start-off costs of buying all these expensive ultrasounds? And there's clearly a salary differential between endocrine surgeons and endocrinologists, and we got through all of that by um, joining a hospital system together. So we bargained our, our salaries separately, and uh, they paid for all the equipment and the multiple offices. Um, there were some hospital system issues in terms of uh, organizational issues. They didn't really know where we fit uh, in their organization. We actually opted to become sort of our own little um, portion of the hospital system that wasn't under medicine or surgery. That worked out very nicely for us. There were some initial concerns about would the radiologist freak out that we were taking away their ultrasound. And actually, that worked out just fine. No problems from the radiology standpoint, nor the pathologist, because we send all our pathology. We use um, Verisite, so we send all our cytology out. The um, pathologists were just happy to get uh, the um, biopsy, you know, the post-surgical biopsies. Uh, remuneration did not turn out to be an issue. It turned out to be great for the endocrinologists because uh, they got linked to the surgeon and they were getting offered a lot more money than they were making in the community. Uh, and the voluntary medical staff at the beginning was a little freaked out when we came because they thought we were going to steal all their business. But in the end, um, uh, that's not what happened. In the end, we ended up with a referral base that, am I doing okay time wise? Or am I doing, okay. yeah. we, we ended up with a referral base uh, that actually loved us. The initial distrust um, sort of melted away and we became like an endocrinology second opinion to a lot of the endocrinologists uh, in, the pro in, in, in the area. Um, 
And it, it kind of worked nicely for me as well because I found that I was becoming the endocrinology second opinion, which meant I was starting to be sent all of these patients who didn't actually need surgery. So I was able to just sort of lateral them to my patient, uh, lateral them to my partner. I mean, I, I just had a patient the other day that clearly was sort of a CYA on the the part of the uh, endocrinologist, and I was able to very quickly tell them, look, you don't need surgery, move on to the next patient, and then my endocrinology partner spent like 45 minutes or an hour with them. Um, <laughs> it worked out nicely. Um, as far as having an expert uh, sonographer in the office, I think that's great. I mean, as an organization, we are constantly uh, telling the rest of the world that it's much better to do 200 thyroids a year than 20 thyroids a year. So having someone in the office doing ultrasound after ultrasound after ultrasound, uh, clearly I think that's gonna be a better job than I would do if I only was doing the ultrasound in the office. Um, we've incorporated all the molecular testing uh, and expert pathologic consultation and evaluation in our office as well. And uh, one thing I've learned is that a lot of the endocrinologists in the community don't want to do their own radioactive iodine. They just want to send you the patient and have them send it back all packaged up. And so now I have endocrinology partners who are willing to do that, so I do not have to be involved in that. Uh, and offloading complex patients is another interesting thing I have found, is that there are endocrinologists in the community that are perfectly happy to take care of a patient with a one centimeter papillary thyroid carcinoma post-op, but throw in a bunch of nodes or uh, a medullary thyroid carcinoma, and they are more than happy to send you the patient and never get it back. So from the community standpoint, from the hospital standpoint, uh, this has worked out very nicely for us. And there's been some unexpected benefits. Uh, I, I, being in the community, I didn't really expect that we'd be doing all that much publishing. Uh, but having endocrinology partners means people in the office all the time who are willing to put together and, and help create a database. And uh, so um, we've done pretty well on the, the publication front as well. The medical students, and it turns out we're starting a residency program this year. The residents, I think, are going to love this as well because when they rotate with us, the medical students get to spend some time with the surgeons, some time with the endocrinologists. It turns out to be a great rotation. And then lastly, uh, something I really didn't expect, which is this sort of I call the endocrine uh, quid pro quo, which is that the endocrinologists in the community who initially didn't know what to make of us and thought we were going to steal their uh, patients now have learned that whenever our office gets a call about diabetes or osteoporosis or testosterone therapy, whatever, we, were, we, we give them their names. So they are more than happy when they find out that uh, they're being referred to all these patients from our practice to send patients back. And it turned out in 2012 that um, it was almost a mandate of uh, a number of the major thyroid societies that uh, communication between uh, all of the, uh, the different constitutive parts of our multidisciplinary team is essential, uh, and that interdisciplinary care is the future of uh, endocrine surgery. So this, in, in my mind, clarified that we had head in the right direction. So we started out with two. We are now up to four, two imaging endocrinologists and two, uh, two endocrine surgeons. Um, our uh, cancer business skyrocketed. We joined the Memorial um, Healthcare System at the beginning of 2011. Um, and uh, when, they, when they came to review our cancer center in 2014, uh, the reviewer actually pulled me aside and said, I wondered why there had been this huge outbreak of thyroid cancer in South Florida um, until I explained to him uh, how our model worked and they were impressed. And our surgical volume has continued to grow uh, exponentially. So to, to sum this up, I, I think that the, the real bottom line to this is collaboration. I mean, this is a practice model that works for us, and I, and I do believe we provide a higher level of patient care, and I think it's been a great business model uh, for both the endocrine surgery and the endocrinology part of the practice. But I think it's, it's really the collaboration uh, which is important, and it, it doesn't have to be done exactly in this way but by collaborating with the endocrinologists closely in the community, you can have a better business model, you can have a higher level of patient care. And I think that the AAS re uh, recognizes this. I think that, that our future is that we're really working on promoting uh, collaboration between the uh, professional societies. Thank you.
If we could have our next poll question up, that would be great. Um, how do you use advanced practice providers in your office? Number one, I don't and can't afford it. Number two, I don't, I don't have, I have other help. Number three, I prefer working alone. Number four, I work with somebody in the office. Number five, I work with someone in the operating room. And number six, I work with someone both in the office and operating room. Um, our next talk, I'd like to introduce Miss Amanda Lewis. She's a physician assistant working with Tom Connolly in Norman, Oklahoma. They share a busy endocrine surgery practice, and she's going to discuss their collaborative work model. Okay, so I know a lot of people don't really know how to use APPs, um, whether they're PAs or nurse practitioners. Um, I joined Dr. Conley about seven years ago, and this definitely wasn't our model. It's formed, and it will continually form throughout the years. Um, but we found what works for us. Um, what works for us is that I keep him in the operating room, and he stays out of my business. That's what works. <laughs> um, but so I'm going to just start from what we do, like bringing referrals in and how that works. Um, we get referrals from all over Oklahoma. Um, they may be three, four, five hours away. Um, and so I try to make sure that those people um, get a one-stop shop. Um, also, people that don't necessarily need a CS. Um, I often get people that come in and they're like, why am I here? Why did I pay a copay? So I try to minimize all of that. Um, so what we do is people send us referrals. Um, our, uh, we have a lady that works for us up front that gets the referrals and she'll send them to me. I'll go through all of their records and um, I'll distinguish kind of where they need to be or if they need to see us. Um, so let's go. So for instance, if I have somebody who lives in the Oklahoma City Metro, we're in Norman, so we're not very far, and they have an elevated calcium level. They're sent from their PCP and they just have an elevated calcium level. Oh. Okay. Um, so what we'll do is if they just have the elevated calcium level coming from their PCP, I'll just say make an appointment and usually I make it with me because they're gonna need further workup. Um, if they're out of town, um, I'll usually contact whoever's sending them to us and ask them if they can get the appropriate labs. That way we can facilitate a quicker appointment and minimize travel. Um, if the person is from the endo and they're completely worked up, um, then they just need an appointment only. If they are completely worked up and they're out of town, then what we'll do is we'll set up all of their testing um, the same day so that they don't have to make multiple um, visits. Uh, when we do get referrals, sometimes we'll get people that do call us and ask, do I need to get imaging beforehand? We say no, let us do that. Um, also, we have some people that do drive from other states to come see us. So if that's the case, usually it's one of the endocrinologists sending to us. Um, we will review all of their stuff and we'll make their um, imaging on a day like Wednesday um, because we're in surgeries most days on Mondays and Thursdays. So we'll have them come in for their imaging and appointment same day, and then they will get their surgery the next day. Just the day-to-day -day tasks. Um, so if we do have that patient that comes in that only has a calcium level, um, I've usually talked to that patient and told them this is what we're gonna get, and then the next steps. So if they need all of their other labs, I'm going to review those when they come in. And um, a lot of them, yes, go ahead and um, set up surgery or set up imaging and surgery. Um, some of them we need to continue meds like their vitamin D and then repeat labs. Um, but just, just kind of the mundane lab review. Um, in clinic, to get things ready, I do pre-chart. Um, so I go through all of their records. I've gone through them twice now. Um, but I go through all of their records and make sure that I have their labs, if they have an old op and path, if they have imaging that's been ordered by another doc. I usually try to request that disc so that our local um, radiologist can actually review that when we get the ultrasound. Um, 
when we schedule surgeries, I also don't let just a surgery scheduler do that. Um, I make sure that we have appropriate surgeries on appropriate days. So I know that if there's somebody um, that's got thyroid cancer that needs a bilateral neck dissection, I'm not going to put seven endocrine surgeries on that day. Um, so I make sure that they, we can maximize our time in the OR. Um, on surgery days, I first assist. I first assist in about 98% of his cases, um, post-op orders, notes, all that fun stuff. On clinic days, so on clinic days, on Tuesdays, uh, we are both in the clinic at the same time. Um, on Wednesdays, I'm in clinic by myself, and then certain Fridays, either he will be in the clinic or we'll both be in the clinic at that time as well. So when I see somebody independently, a lot of people are fine with seeing me. They don't want to come back and see him because not they don't want to see him, but they don't want to waste another trip. They think that they're perfectly fine seeing him the day before surgery. Now, not everybody is that way. Um, if they want to come back, that's completely fine. They come back before surgery and they discuss the plan with him. Oftentimes, I'll have them get their imaging and then he has everything to discuss with them at that time. Um, if you have somebody who looks at you because they have glassy eyes and they have no idea what you just said, then I kind of reel it back and I don't tell them as much we tell them what our next step is, and then we'll bring them back. So you just have to read your patient um, and how they feel about it. But a lot of patients are fine with just seeing me. When we do do joint clinic, I'll usually see the patient first, do kind of go over everything, their history, their meds, tell them our plan. Then Dr. Conley will come in and say hi to them and go over our plan again with them. And then I move on to the next patient. So that allows us to see 30 plus patients a day when we have a full clinic. Um, my other roles to help with, cl help with um, clinic and everything is I'm, we still do general surgery cases. But if we don't have time to get to that gallbladder, I don't want somebody's gallbladder waiting weeks. Um, and so when they send the referral to me, I'll say, well, I don't have a spot for a week or two, so send to one of the partners. So that not only facilitates them getting taken care of, um, but that facilitates the surgery schedule as well. On call, um, we still have general surgery on call, like a lot of people still do. We, so my main goal on on-call on weekends is I don't necessarily am in the OR with him. I manage the rounds um, and do notes and help with the inpatient. Um, Dr. Conley usually has a talk in Oklahoma with our PA society, um, and I've stayed in that side society to help facilitate that. So th there's always something, thyroid nodules, parathyroid. We have endocrinologists that will come all the time and, and talk with us. So I make sure that I stay in that society so that I can have endocrinologists and people come still talk to the public about it, um, just because you get all those people that you get a calcium and a PTH, but they don't have a vitamin D. So just things that they could learn that would help facilitate everything that you do. We work with endocrinologists. They're not necessarily in our building, um, but we have multiple groups throughout the metro. And so they have both my number, Dr. Conley's number, and they call us directly. So we're always in constant contact with the endocrinologist. Um, to the, obtain that re and review outside imaging. When they do have their nuclear medicine scan outside, what we do is we'll set them up um, with an ultrasound, have the radiology team review the ultrasound and the new med disc that they've brought us, and let us know if that disc was valid or not, if it was a good study or not a good study. Um, here's kind of my RVUs. Um, the main gist is I know that in the um, APP meeting yesterday morning, somebody was asking about um, how do you stick, keep the higher ups from looking at all your RVUs and wondering what you do? Well, you have to look at yourself as a whole. So you ha me and Dr. Conley, I look at us as a whole. And that was difficult when I first started because I was one of the first PAs in the group um, to get everybody on board that we are one. Everything that we do is for this one practice. Um, so I think the main, the main goal for me is 
to keep his schedule going. So if he's out of town for a couple of weeks, then his surgery schedule's there when he gets back. He's not in a lull. And that's one of the main goals for me. So for instance, I had a baby a couple of years ago and for the last month of my pregnancy, I stayed in the clinic and I made his sure that his surgery was somewhat full for my maternity leave. Um, that was just to facilitate and to help so that there wasn't a lull in anybody's, the patients weren't waiting, Dr. Conley wasn't waiting, the new med wasn't backed up because that frequently happens. Um, so those are just ways that, that I try to keep things going. Um, I asked him, I said, what, what is your, what have you liked about having a PA? And he says, well, I don't get the phone calls. You take all the phone calls. You deal with all the office issues. You do all the labs. He said, I don't have to micromanage. And he gets to enjoy more vacation time with his family. So I think the main part and the main um, gist of a, a advanced uh, provider is that we can help alleviate all the mundane things where you can relax and focus on the bigger picture um, and less stress. So thank you. Um, uh, can we get our next uh, poll question? So this uh, next poll question is, do you use telemedicine? And um, answers um, you can see there listed in front of you. So please go ahead and uh, Take a little bit of time to go through that. We will have time for questions afterwards as well, so write down questions as you're going uh, along. Um, telemedicine, I think, is a great avenue for each of us to explore. Um, I live in a state where I have patients that are four or five hours away and still in the state, and so um, you know something like this can be very, very helpful. So, um, our next speakers, um, uh, Dr. Ye was uh, supposed to be speaking for us, and uh, obviously is not able to now, and so. Uh, Dr. Masha Levitz and uh, Dr. Phoebe Zhang are um, uh, stepping up to the plate and uh, on fairly short notice taking over, so we very much appreciate that. Um, um, so, yeah, let's go back to our slides. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just want to say that we have an NP in our practice, Jennifer, who's in the audience, who actually fulfills uh, similar roles to what was just discussed and is really amazing. So, thank you, Jen. Um, okay, so um, we um, really implemented um, telemed telemedicine as part of our endocrine surgery distance program. So we have patients really from all over the country um, who end up flying in for surgery here in Los Angeles with us. Um, to date, there have been over 1,000 patients, mostly domestic, um, from 37 states uh, in the U.S., uh, including international patients as well. Um, they come from all over. Um, a, lo a lot of the patients come from the coast. Um, we have patients from Hawaii, a lot of patients from the Nevada area. Um, so, you know, why use um, telemedicine? I mean, it really helps to facilitate these patients who are coming from all over the place um, to provide them with the best level of care, um, depending on what is really available in their local community, um, and making it efficient. Um, and telemedicine is really sort of perfect for our practice in particular. Um, it allows visual inspection of the wounds in our post-operative patients, um, obviously listening to the voice, hearing the quality of their cough. Um, and it's more than just a phone call. You can establish more of a relationship with the patients um, by seeing their nonverbal cues, um, and they're able to actually see you, see what you interact like, and they really feel like they get to know you better um, and to build trust with you. Um, patients really tend to enjoy this, um, and um, we have a very positive patient feedback um, that they really feel like this is much more of a, a physical encounter rather than um, just sort of, a, of what a phone call would be. Um, and uh, it, it certainly is efficient for our patients as well to avoid the drive. Um, you know, we have patients who live geographically maybe not that far, but maybe four hours away in traffic, and this really helps um, uh, those, the, you know, even for the patients as well to not take an entire day off just to come in for a consultation, but to have a 15-minute um, telemedicine consultation with us. Um, it involves, we'll show you later, the ability to involve um, other stakeholders, such as family members, um, to share uh, imaging studies um, at the time of the consultation. Um, and to really offload your clinic. That's one of the major benefits um, is to allow some of these post-operative uh, patients, for example, um, to be at a different time slot so that your physical clinic space um, is reserved for a lot of the initial consultations. Um, and uh, Dr. Zhang will discuss that you can bill for it. 
So if you're interested in starting telemedicine, you're probably figuring out, well, how, where should I start? So the really low-hanging fruit is the post-op global, um, since you don't get paid if the patient comes to see you in person, and you don't get paid if the patient sees you via telemedicine. So that's probably the easiest place to start. Um, Initial consultations are a little bit tricky depending on state laws. So there are some states where if you don't have an established relationship with the patient, you cannot see that patient via telemedicine as your initial encounter. But the laws are actively changing for all of these issues in all of the states. Um, Preoperative counseling is also an area where you can do telemedicine. That one you can actually get paid for, and we'll show you a little bit data later where you can actually, you will be reimbursed by most commercial insurance companies level for level the same amount because in the vast majority of states there are what are called telemedicine um, parity laws that um, regulate that you should be paid the same amount regardless of whether that visit occurs in person or via telemedicine. Um, another thing that is a little bit tricky about the initial consultation is that um, you need to have a telemedicine license to be able to practice if your patient is com coming from a different state. So for example, currently I'm in Houston, but I actually get a lot of patients from Louisiana. I cannot actually legally see that patient as initial encounter from Louisiana. Um, but what I can do, and I think this has been the model at UCLA as well, is that you can at least gather the data and see if that patient warrants a visit. And then that initial discussion is actually not a formal consultation that you're not gonna bill for, but it's just a, hey, this is what we could possibly do for you. I think um, we've reviewed your data. You, it's probably a good idea for you to come and see us in person. Um, so this is actually the UCLA experience for the technology platform. So when they started in 2015, we were mostly on WebEx, and there were so many patient-side failures. So basically for WebEx, the patient had to download this plugin, and like some people like didn't have an updated browser, so then the plugin wouldn't work. In 2016, we moved to Zoom, which was much easier. So everybody gets a unique link, and you just click on the link, and then you're in the room. Um, so we definitely got higher levels of um, adoption and patient success on that. And then the other thing that was great for Zoom was that we were able to get um, people from um, different family members who were geographically um, distributed to be on the same call. Um, and Masha will show you a little bit about that later. And then finally in 2017, there was Epic integration. So Epic, there are two vendors. There's both video, which is V-I-D-Y-O, and then also Zoom that can be integrated into your Epic. And that just makes it so much easier from a documentation standpoint. So when I was a fellow at UCLA, we actually looked at this to make make sure that we were actually going to be paid the amount that the law said we were gonna get paid. So California is one of those states that does have telemedicine parity. Um, so we um, looked at our telemedicine experience and we looked at the charges that we filed. We made sure that the initial claim denial rate was the same and then that we, sh we actually collected the same amount, um, visit per visit versus our in-person, uh, level per level versus our uh, in-person visits. But really, the major benefit of telemedicine, I think, is the time and distance saved on the patient side. And so you can see that, especially um, for LA, the patients were driving these huge distances and spending this huge amount of time on traffic. And then the other thing, like Masha said, was that it really can offload some of your physical clinic space to enable, maybe not you, but other providers to be able to utilize that space to see new patients. Um, one thing I'll say is that you do have to be very well organized. The, the benefit of a phone call is that you can do it whenever. So you know you have a patient that you're meaning to call. You can do it whenever it's convenient for you. Um, obviously, the telemedicine, it's a scheduled appointment. The patient is there uh, waiting for you, so you need to be there you know, appropriately on time. Um, so that should be blocked off in your schedule. Um, and so this is a real patient, you know, a patient with um, multiply recurrent thyroid cancer, and now we're discussing the possibility of a fourth or fifth operation. Um, he's in college. He has parents, um, you know, they're busy working people that live in, that are currently in s separate states. So all three of these people are now together um, with the physician, that, that's Michael over there, um, having a, a discussion, you know, about the possibility of a somewhat high-risk fourth operation. Um, and this is really a, a very efficient and also kind of very meaningful way to have 
this real discussion with the patient and family members. Um, and and it's, it's also kind of fun. Um, you see people in their home environment. You know, we'll see people with their dogs running around in the back. Uh, you know, in the background. Um, and so you you really feel like you kind of get a sense of what's going on with the patient. Um, they you know they see you um, with your office in the background. Um, this is a patient who you know had an operation, and then um, this is her Halloween costume. So. Um, when I talk about telemedicine with some of the people in my department, because I'm trying to implement this department-wide, these are some of the excuses that I've heard. Um, but I've actually found that telemedicine can save you time. Like, I've noticed that my post-op visits for telemedicine are actually much shorter than the in-person post-op visit. And there's no rooming, there's no taking of vital signs, you're not getting paid for that visit anyway, so you just actually want to reassure the patient, but make it as short as possible. Um, the technology has really improved over the past couple of years so that it's really easy for both the provider and the patient. Um, there are definitely advantages f um, over using a platform than using just a simple phone call. And I will say that telemedicine is not for every patient, but you'd be surprised the types of patients that are willing to accept telemedicine. So I routinely get people who are in their 80s and 70s who say that would be great. I really don't want to drive into the med center and have to pay $30 for parking and then lose half my day. Um, so one thing I will say that um, that is making this a lot easier for us in terms of the timing is that the regulations are really catching up. So um, there's this thing called the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, and what this allows is that basically um, all these states that are um, in blue have agreed that you can get an accelerated telemedicine license. So, for example, you just apply for one license and you decide how, which of these states you want to apply, um, be licensed in, and there's actually an accelerated process to get just a telemedicine license for those states. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk about some implementation tips. Um, so ideally, you would use a platform that doesn't require any type of plug-in download by your patients. Ideally, the platform is integrated into your EHR for billing purposes. Um, you should, if you're going to do it for post-ops, it's um, important to add it to your consultation pre-op counseling that this is a, an option because if you just talk about it in the five minutes after the patient's being discharged after your surgery, um, they're not as conducive to this. Um, and then like Masha was saying, you should really template it into your schedule on a predictable day, maybe at the very, very beginning of your clinic or right before your clinic. Um, you should have a backup plan for the inevitable technical failure. Um, and then if you really, really don't want to do this, especially for at least the easy post-ops, you can actually get your advanced practice provider to do it for you. Um, and I'll just end by sort of summarizing how this ties into our distance program, um, which, like I said, really kind of has been growing every year. Um, and so the first step is really just organizing all of the data. Um, and that can be done pretty quickly for a lot of our patients. You get labs, you know, whatever imaging studies that they've gotten. And that can take a very brief amount of time to assemble. You can train most people in your clinic staff um, to do that. And once you've reviewed those records, which, again, can take a very short period of time, um, then the, the telemedicine uh, initial consultation is scheduled and that can lead to a fairly high uh, surgical yield of, of patients uh, coming in for surgery. Um, and then again, the post-operative visit ends up being telemedicine again. So you have a patient maybe flying in um, just for a one-time surgery, um, which works out very well for everyone. Thank you. Great. Can we have the next, the next polling question, please? Uh, this one is, do you utilize more than one operating room at a time? Number one, I don't want to. Number two, my hospital won't allow it. Um, C, I, yes, I move into the next operating room. And D, yes, I have two operating rooms dedicated to my patients. While we're doing that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Doug Fraker, professor of surgery at University of Pennsylvania. He's going to talk to us about optimizing scheduling and operating room time. Good afternoon. So um, I just want to comment that I use telemedicine. I use advanced practice providers. <laughs> My advanced practice provider has his own telemedicine appointments, and I know you mentioned it, but parking in our facility in Philadelphia is very similar to parking in Santa Monica on a sunny April weekend. 
And so if you can save 15 parking spots doing 15 post stops, that's a huge plus too for other patients. But um, uh, Michael and Julia have asked me to talk about operating room efficiency. So I am an endocrine surgeon. I didn't modify my slide, but I am one. I'm a relatively busy endocrine surgeon. And so I have no disclosures. And the objectives uh, that I want to just mention today is to maximize operating room efficiency while maintaining clinical excellence. And it's really uh, all uh, steps from scheduling uh, to lining up your case order. And then I'll talk about, spend a bit of time talking about two rooms because we all complain about OR turnover and two rooms is certainly an answer to uh, efficiency and maximizing uh, caseload. So the first question is, who selects uh, the data procedure in your practice? And I'm always mind boggled when some of my associates in my own division, I say, oh, this day is impossible. I can't believe they put so many cases on or this group of cases on. I said, are you kidding me? I mean, you're letting them do that? Uh, I was glad to hear Amanda say that she, she, she polices that herself. Uh, and it's, it's kind of strange when people don't. So I've been doing this for 25 years. I've got 25 years of these books. Yes, we have computers at the University of Pennsylvania, <laughs> and everything gets entered on the computer. But if you have, and I don't think you can read the names and so forth in terms of HIPAA, uh, but that's a week. You put stickers down, you put the case down, you take a red pen, you say, this is a huge goiter, this is great, this is not a one and a half hour thyroid. You put a red pen down at the bottom and you say, it's my wife's birthday and I'm gonna make dinner tonight. <laughs> or we have a tickets for the orchestra or the Philadelphia Speaker Series or something like that that other people in the scheduling office don't know. So you just have to manage your own time. And I use it with his books and then uh, uh, it's easy to see uh, what you have and what you have available. So um, as you select the dates, be realistic about your operative times. A thyroid is not a thyroid is not a thyroid. There are body habitus, there is size of the thyroid, there is lymph nodes, there is previous surgery, there is thyroiditis. So Dr. Shah, I, I, I mentioned to him I was gonna email him for one of his slides because he has great slides, and he has his rules of two that I've heard dozens of times. All surgeons augment their volume by two if you say how many thyroids you do a year and you do 20, ah, oh, 400. And you say, how quick can you do it? Oh, I do it in an hour. It's two hours. So you take the time times two, and you, you take the volume divided by two. That's Ashak Shah's rule of twos. And so you just have to be honest. You know, Herb asks, who are you? And you say, what are my operative times, I would say. And, and, and uh, uh, you have to really be realistic about that. And so then we get to the operating room schedule. And you have room turnover. So uh, a lot of what we do is uh, able to be done in two rooms. And parathyroids, I think, is the best example, especially localized parathyroids, which you teach monitoring. There's a lot of downtime when you're not operating and so forth. Um, thyroid lobectomies, small thyroids, limited neck dissections. There are other things, 14 centimeter pheos, adrenal cancers invading the IVC, whipples for, uh, that are not amenable. And so you have days when you can do two rooms, and I, I was walking up where I didn't see the results of the survey, and, and uh, and so I, I don't know how many people have access to that, but clearly a lot of what we do can be done in overlapping rooms and not violate any rules and not compromise patient care, in my opinion. So we're all aware in December 2015, the Boston Globe Spotlight team reported these concurrent surgeries, these 10 hour spine surgeries that were done within 15 minutes, uh, lasting all day with a complication and then that had brought this uh, issue to light, addressed by all the regulatory commissions, American College of Surgeons, and then um, you know, one of the choices was my hospital doesn't allow it, and that's certainly one way to handle it. Our hospital allows it, and I just wanna go over uh, what the appropriate rules are and how you manage it in terms of running your practice and your patient care. So concurrent versus overlapping. So you need to define the critical portions of a procedure. And you may say critical skin incision to, to the, the final biasing going in, but there are critical parts of the operation, clearly raising flaps and, and, and so forth, or the closure I think most of us would consider is not critical. Uh, you cannot overlap or have simultaneous two rooms with critical portions. 
That's called concurrent surgery. That is not allowed by my institution, and I don't think that's correct. You can overlap non-critical persons in two rooms. You cannot be in three rooms where you have either incision to Band-Aid. You, you can have patients in three rooms going to sleep if you at least have one of the other rooms closed and so forth. But I'm not even going to get into three-room surgery because that's in my past. I've given that up. Uh, and so another aspect of this is you cannot leave a critical part of a procedure, go to a second room for a short case, and come back. That is not allowed. You can't bill for those two surgeries. And so you can't be doing a Whipple and then go do a quick localized parathyroid or a lobe while they're doing pathology or getting the bowel loop ready and then come back and do the anastomosis. That's not allowed. The part where you get burned, and I'll talk about some kind of pitfalls in just a few minutes, but um, is when the PTH doesn't drop or something like that. And so uh, that's when it, uh, the system breaks down to some extent or, or you have an, an issue where you've got a second room starting, but you move. Well, I'll show you a case uh, that happened to me. Uh, and you have to have a backup surgeon designated that is in the medical facility that's documented, uh, and that person has to know about it. I don't know if that's a national, that's a rule at the University of Pennsylvania, and I think that's an appropriate rule. So again, as you're doing your schedule, you have to be honest about operative times. And so not only do I do my schedule in terms of picking dates, but if you're running, you know, first case to fourth case or fifth case at a room, you want to line them up in an appropriate way that it will go that. And I look at everything from BMI to the imaging. I look at laboratories. It always bugs me when the patients have a calcium of 10.4 and a PTH of high normal and they're negative imaged. And, and especially if they're a guy with a big neck, they say, well, this is not going to be a quick case. And so uh, comorbidities. So there are some people that have features where you'd like to put them at the end of the day, but they're pretty brittle diabetics. And so they have to go early. So you have to also take that into account. Do the schedule yourself. Same comment about picking uh, uh, OR dates. Uh, uh, I line up my case and I'll show you how I do that. And you do the long cases at the end. And the other thing that I think is very important, I disclose everything to my patients. So I have that book and I'm picking a date and they say, wow, all those stickers are operations. I say, yeah, I have two rooms. I say, the room turnover is longer than the case. I do your surgery. They know about it in clinic. They know about it the day of surgery. I come and I say, you are the first patient in my second room. You will say, everybody leave. I will call for you when it's appropriate time. And that's how I do it, and I tell the family set. And they're fine with that in terms of doing the high volume. So uh, disclosure is always important. So this was a couple Fridays ago, March 15th. Uh, and I had seven parathyroids and two thyroid lobes, including some enucleations of thyroid nodules. That's a different discussion topic. And so I have a cheat sheet. I just I cross out the names, of course, but I have the names, I have the age. I have their imaging studies, the parathyroids are on top, the, the thyroids on the bottom. And then I look at who's imaged, who's not imaged. There's a question mark about their labs not being very good. And I line them up from one to nine. So I plan a day, five cases in one room, four cases in another, and just line them up based on that. So I start with a localized parathyroid, then I go to a thyroid lobe and gets the day off to a good start. And then I have room 1551. I line these cases up for the scheduler and in parentheses of their OR times. And again, they're realistic times. And so we use a computerized system called Navicare. There's nothing in terms of HIPAA, there's no patient names or anything like that. I don't know how this uh, projects, but the, uh, you can see I have five cases in one room, four in another, I'm positioned and prepping. If you look at the far left-hand column uh, in the first room, uh, the second patient is ready to come back. The patient to follow in the first room is, um, is in the check-in area. And you can see the times of arrival, that's the next column. And so they see there's a good stagger. And so here's another corollary rule. Never, ever, ever call in patients early. I never do that. And the, the staff always wants to do that. There's always delays. And you, you, you know, you, you knock around, it's stressful, and you're supposed to come in at 10, you have your rights up, and somebody calls you, say, come at 9. Then you have to go into the operating room at 11. It's a huge patient dissatisfaction, so never call them in early. And on the right-hand panel, we have our backup surgeon. Now you can say Dr. DiMatteo doesn't know how to do a parathyroid. He's a very skilled guy. He's in a clinic just down the hall, about 45 seconds away. I always check with him, uh, and so he was my backup surgeon. So if we just go through the day, you see a slide at 9.30, a slide at 1.15. These are patients dropping off the map. I'm closing in one room, the patient's there. I'm cutting the, the second room, the patient's in the check-in area. The circle somehow got displaced, but you see after my name, RD, that's uh, Ron DiMatteo. So if you enter an epic, 
it communicates with our computerized uh, scheduling system. It tells everybody who my backup uh, surgeon is, and it's all documented. And I have data also from text messages and emails that he's available that day. And then at 115, we're down to, we're putting a Band-Aid on case number six. Got three cases left, uh, and the day is going well. So with this Navicare system, you can, you can pull out case times. You can pull out incision to closing to waking up and so forth. It's good to compare anesthesia attendings, but that's not the purpose of this talk. Uh, and you can see room 50, room 51. The blue part is the surgery times. So you can see I delayed going back in room 51. And there's not much overlap. So if you look at the fourth case in room 50, that's a parathyroid localized by ultrasound only, bilateral expiration. Found two normals, one abnormal, PTH didn't drop. Um, it was an intrathyroidal second abnormal found by ultrasound, taken out. And so there were, uh, there was no overlap. We were waiting for the pathology in what I thought was going to be an intrathyroidal and then another PTH level with a patient being closed. And then in an ideal world, you can see I operated till almost 7 that night. That fifth case in room 50 would have flipped into a, a third room because it was the end of the day, but all rooms were very busy uh, running at that point in time. But it's still, we got everything done. But you can see the blues don't overlap. And then I do two cases. I always see my patients pre-op, and I always talk to the families post-op. So I'll go out to the waiting room and talk to two families at once because they already know I'm running two rooms. I said, i got to talk to these people first. There's a PTH, and I go and talk to the thyroid family. There are always unexpected findings. False positive imaging parathyroid in your first case of the day, that's a bad one. So now you got a non-localized situation and you're trying to get another room started. Uh, so I always put something that looks really solid co-localized uh, as a first case. Finding th thyroid pathology, probably a dozen times in my career I've been doing parathyroids and I find a lymph node on frozen section that has papillary thyroid cancer. That's a real uh, uh, screw up the day. And so you tell everybody, you tell the next to follow patients, you say, look, the, this patient had an unexpected cancer, everything's going to be delayed. It's like when you're waiting for the, your plane that's not taken off, you're much better when they tell you exactly what's going on than when you just sit there for like an hour on the runway and you don't know. So you tell people they accept it. And then with parathyroids, it's the same thing. It's a, when the PTH doesn't drop, uh, do we do you know, minimally invasive and bilateral convert to bilateral. I mean, I, I, I have now taken the practice uh, mostly for time and mostly for the instance of multiple gland disease and problems I've had with PTH monitoring to do bilateral expirations. Uh, and do you have to wait for the interruptive pH to drop? So there are many differences between myself and Herb Chen. One is I've done that for years. Instead of writing an academic article about it like Herb and Huggy did, I made a catchphrase called Going Rogue, not in honor of Sarah Palin, but she did call her autobiography Going Rogue. Uh, and so we'd say we're going rogue. We had one clear adenoma. You have to have a clear adenoma and three other glands identified. You don't have to wait for the PTH, a very fast operation, a thin person. Herb, of course, uh, wrote it up for the literature. So there's now, since the December 2015 uh, Spotlight article, there's now literature on this. This is a multi-institutional study, Michigan, Stanford, Penn, Harvard, and it looked at nothing that we do. It was hip, knee replacement, spine surgery, cardiac surgery, and craniotomy. And they, it was, they had 66,000 cases, 8,000 had overlapping times, and this is the data. There's no difference in mortality or complications. If you take people that are classified as high risk, by what other mechanism, there is a difference when you overlap. When you look at operative time, there's a very significant difference. So that just came out in, uh, in JAMA. And so there's, I'm sure, going to be more and more literature on this as people are valuing. But their conclusions were that you can do this safely because there was no uh, difference in mortality and so forth. And so you can use that, I guess, to go to your hospital administrators and say, we're going to be more efficient and, and we can get a lot more cases done uh, with all the downstream revenue by doing two rooms. So in closing, uh, this is what I tell my trainees, always do every surgical procedure as if it's the only thing that's going on that day at that point in time. Uh, that's your obligation to that patient you're operating at that point in time. And you're not, you can't be thinking about going to the next room and so forth. And, uh, and so uh, uh, it's, it, it tends to work if you can line it up. Be realistic about your abilities in terms of the timing. It's better for patient satisfaction. It certainly makes the schedule uh, run easily. And pay attention to all micromanage your schedule. Scheduling cases, scheduling the date, how they line up, and trust no one else to do it. And also disclose everything to your patients. 
especially with this article and what's in the um, press and so forth. If you tell them up front, this is how I do it. And then if you have a problem, you go out and tell them. I go out and personally tell them, you know, the parathyroid level didn't drop on the previous patient. We've got to go back and look. You're going to be delayed here for a little bit. Uh, I'll do the same for you to make sure everybody's cured today. And so if you're honest with patients and tell them, it's not an issue. I don't think it's, it's certainly not been an issue for me doing it for over 20 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to each of our speakers. Uh, very excellent talks, uh, excellent ideas presented. Um, as uh, people are starting to come up for questions, could you put up the last uh, poll everywhere question? And this is just uh, efficiency based on your RVU. So how many RVUs do you generate in a typical year? Uh, answers uh, less than 4,000, 4 to 6,000, 6 to 8. 8 to 10 and greater than 10, or we don't use an RVU model, or you don't know. So, um, and why don't we just go ahead and leave that up while uh, people are asking questions. Dr. Pranger? Um, I, I, I learned a lot in this panel. It was very useful. And I just came up to say, um, I know human cloning is p happening, and I'm hoping that Amanda can clone herself <laughs> and bring herself to Boston. <laughs> Kandel, New Jersey, so there's no question in my mind, the APNs are amazing. Um, the issue is the health systems want concrete data um, as to how they're, how they're generating revenue and RVUs. So if you take away your RVUs that you generate through assisting, because they, at least in our health system, they're separate in intraoperative PAs versus in the office PAs, um, how do you justify and how do you generate the revenue? And, justify your presence in the practice? So I, I'm the only one. I don't, I'm in the office and in the OR, um, so I do both. Honestly, the RVUs that I, my administration's pretty great because they, I know that you don't get RVUs for post-ops. However, they look at my entire schedule and see what we do as a whole. I think that's the main thing, is they look at what he's doing um, we weren't doing an RVU system when I started, so it was hard to say what he was doing before I came. Um, but for the, the rest of the years, they'd look at just us as a whole. Dr. Connolly, do you think you could give, do you think you might have an estimate on maybe a volume change or an RVU change, a caseload, since your collaboration? Sure. I think specifically for us is that um, we've grown up the intercom practice tremendously since Amanda started because of the patient satisfaction and the physician's satisfaction with those referrals. Um, they know they're always going to have an expert seeing their patient. So we, when Amanda and I started, I was, again, you can do the Dr. Ashok's rule divide, but we were doing, you know, maybe 150 cases a year, uh, and we're over 400 cases a year now. So, and we expect to see that to continue to, gr to grow. Again, I'm dropping general surgery volume to do more specific intercontinental cases. And so, Amanda not only is improving the surgical volume, she's improving all these referrals for ultrasound and pathology and all these other pieces that are in the system. And it offloads our endocrinologists who need to do diabetes. There's such a need in Oklahoma. We have a very large Native American population who's suffering with diabetes. They don't have access to care. So she's. She's doing a lot of endocrinology work on her own. People can't get access for uh, hyperthyroidism. Amanda gets them started right away. She's calling the endocrinologist. I have a patient with hyperthyroidism. We need to uh, uh, get them started on methimazole. Here's my plan. Are you okay with that? And then those patients have a subsequent visit. So there's a lot of moving pieces that in our administration respects uh, in order to improve our volume. So. But do, do you do actually any billing? She does. So, so, for what? So she, so she bills Besides for, the did, OR. so they bill for the OR and they bill for her clinic volume, her clinic patients that you see. So the the uh, e visit, she bills for those. So if we see them together, I do the essential parts so that I can be a part of that billing process because there's a be obviously a better revenue. So I do the essential parts and do my part of the note to make sure we can do that. But but when she's seeing her patients individually, she's she has her own RVU generation and her, there's a report that generates her income and her income response to that, so. Great, thank you. Sam. Sam Snyder from Harlingen, Texas. I, I, I enjoyed your presentation, David, because 
I've actually seen your practice, your, your partner here, one of my former fellows, and she let me go into your office, and it's really ideal setup that you have. You've got endocrinologists and surgeons sharing the same, more or less the same practice office. You, you can work so easily together, but most of us don't have that set up. Uh, I would say most of us have a referral base maybe from endocrinologists. And so the question I have for the panel is, when do you release the patient back to the endocrinologist after an operation? That is an excellent question, and uh, it turned out to be a little more difficult than I expected. Um, one of the tenets of our practice was we don't keep any patients. Uh, I felt that the day that we started uh, keeping patients in our practice and they didn't come back to their endocrinologist was the day that people would stop sending us patients and feel that we're stealing their patients. So uh, I, I make a, a concerted effort to get everyone to go back. The problem is that a lot of the patients come meet our endocrinologist and don't want to go back. So. Um, I have, have made it clear to a lot of the patients at the beginning that we, our practice is a surgical practice. Our endocrinologists don't follow patients. They, they send them back. So um, I send patients back right after surgery. Um, uh, timing why, you know, from a, a temporal standpoint, um, if they have thyroid cancer, after I see them on their first post-operative visit, I try to send them right back to their endocrinologist. Um, Parathyroid patients are a little bit more complicated, I think, because a lot of them don't really need to be followed by an endocrinologist. So uh, if they really don't want to, sometimes I'll check their post-operative labs, prove that uh, they're cured, and, and I know we, we use the six-month number, uh, tell them that from my standpoint, everything's gone well surgically, and then follow up with their primary care doctor and make sure that they do their six-month follow-up if they're not gonna go back to their endo. Very good. Is that similar for the other panel members? So I agree with that. So um, probably 75% of my patients come from outside endocrinologists, and it's clearly a referral killer if you say, oh, no, no, you can't go there, you got to come back. So when they want to see a, somebody in our institution, I say, look, this is how this business of referrals and works. If you are not happy with endocrinologists, please go have a conversation with them and say you'd like to get another opinion at Penn or something like that. So I put the onus on them. I agree with what was said. Uh, you could even argue that uh, in the, the slides were shown in the first talk, do parathyroid patients need to go to endocrinologists? Often they obstruct them from getting the appropriate surgery. I think there should be a direct pass from primary care to, to parathyroid centers of excellence. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't manage osteoporosis, so they may need an endocrinologist for that, but a non-osteoporotic parathyroid patient who is cured does not need an endocrinologist. So I would agree with that. Very good. Thank I'd kind of be curious to see what, the, what you guys are doing from the telemedicine standpoint with your post-op patients? I mean, you're not seeing I try to see every neck post-op, so, you know, I agree with everything that was said in that very nice uh, presentation from uh, the ladies here. The, I, it, it, it opens up more rooms in your clinic, and so if, if you're a post-op coming from Scranton to see that, it is a three-hour drive. It is a hassle to park. It fills up in <laughs> midday prime times. Then you're going to wait in the waiting room for 45 minutes, and then I'm gonna see you in the room after my nurse practitioner sees you. Or, I do 15-minute blocks. I have five hours scheduled, so I could see it's essentially um, uh, 20 patients if I wanted to. It normally is not that much. They're often they're pulled over the side of the road. They're in a parking lot, and they're in their car and their cell phone because they were driving home from work, but they, they kept their 345 appointment, and so they never wait. They don't have to pay for parking. You see everything. You hear everything. The, the digital images are cured. I don't use it for preoperative visit there. And I'm, the license is involved, but because of a little change in my career at some point, I am licensed in New Jersey. But, so I can see my New Jersey patients, where a lot of them come from uh, uh, legally, because I'm licensed in New Jersey. Uh, so at least right now, you have to be licensed in the state in which they are sitting when you're seeing them. Uh, and we're close to Delaware, New Jersey, and so forth, Maryland. So, but I use it only for post-ops, but I'm interested in expanding it to um, preoperative screening. For our distance patients, we uh, have a telemedicine post-op at two weeks after surgery. And then for the parathyroid patients, benign thyroid nodule patients, um, I really remind them at that time to see their endocrinologist who referred the patient to us, who often is, you know, come from some distance to us. And I think that does help to c continue the, re the referral. Um, the thyroid cancer patients, I, I ask them to come back once a year so that I can do the ultrasound myself, at least for the first couple of years. Um, they don't necessarily do that, but I do advise them that I'd like them to do that. Take the right mic. Hi, James Sullaberg from uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, 
compliments to the panel of really outstanding talks. I have a question specific to telemedicine. I'm a big fan of telemedicine, but have run into a roadblock, and I wanted to ask the panel as well as anybody else in the audience if they have this. Our compliance department reviewed our use of telemedicine for post-op of Medicare patients, and they indicated that uh, Medicare, our Medicare contractor, views the post-op in-person visit as part of the bundled payment that we're receiving um, for the thyroidectomy or the parathyroidectomy. And as such, they have advised me that I cannot do Medicare patients uh, as a post-op visit. I'm curious if anybody else in the uh, panel or the audience has run into a similar roadblock. It makes no sense to me, um, but you know the, the compliance department is what it is, and, and I have to abide by those rules. Yeah, so the Medicare population is very challenging because technically for a Medicare patient to receive telemedicine services, they have to be at a different facility. They can't even be in their home and they have to be in a healthcare shortage area. And so at UCLA, we actually do not see Medicare patients for telemedicine um, for either initial or post-op visits. But I will say that this is an area that's actively changing. So just two days ago, the final rule came out where for starting in 2020, Medicare Advantage patients are able to get telemedicine services from their home. So this is an area that's actively evolving. Um, Mio Kitano from San Antonio. Thank you very much for the very informative panel discussion. Um, this is more of a question for Dr. Fraker. So how do you balance efficiency with education well, at an institution where there are residents? Because, you know, I often let residents do the case, uh, especially for chief residents to do the case from skin to skin, and the level of tr training and their set skill set can, be, can vary tremendously from resident to resident. So some residents may take much longer to find a nerve or, you know, so, so how do you balance or do you have a cutoff of how much you let your trainees struggle and... <laughs> so, I mean, do you, are you scrubbed? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, under, under direct supervision. Yeah, it's yeah. hard for me physically to watch them struggle and not put my hands in there. I, just, I mean, it's like an autonomic response. So, the, um, so I don't, ex I can't really comment on that. No, I, you know, I to work with residents, so I got several of my trainees sitting over in the second row. So the, um, uh, the, I think that you need to let people do with their abilities and people vary and you have a two month block and you're working together and you're going to have them do more of it in the third week and the sixth week and the ninth week than they are in the first day. And so they, because they're such a high volume, they, they, they work with things. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I think there's a balance in training. The other part with the overlapping is they're doing a lot aut autonomously and they can comment their goal is to get the parathyroid at least identified, if not removed, before I get there. And so that's true autonomy. And so um, uh, that I, I generally have a rule, please don't take anything out till I get there. Um. Yeah, um, Colin Weber, Atlanta. Uh, Doug, I just have a comment from my own practice over the years. Um, I have never run two rooms, ever. I find it terrifying, uh, the possibility of, of having something go wrong in room one when I'm in room two. It's just a comment, but that's how I practiced for 35 years. Um, Richard Harding, Phoenix. I, I also don't use two rooms, but I would love to use two rooms. <laughs> <laughs> but my hospital considers the timeout a critical point of the case. So how do you get around the timeout? So the, um, uh, I consider identifying the incision in a neck a critical part of the case. Uh, I have a big problem with the timeout. Uh, I think the timeout is nonsense. I think to tell me that I have to like identify myself and do this. I say, if you want to do a real timeout, let's all look at the cytology. Let's look at the imaging. Let's look at this. Let's say, are there alternative treatments? And then let's say, is this OR team qualified to do this case? That's a timeout I can sink my teeth into. So that's not the question you asked. That is so the, um, the uh, <laughs> so I think identifying the appropriate skin crease in terms of the, the height on the neck. Most guys have low riding larynxes. Their cricoid might be right at the sternal notch when they're extending and so forth. That's a totally different than a person with a long neck and so forth. I will scrub out of room A to go to room B and mark the incision. And at that point, I'll do the timeout. So even if I have to go back to the other room, that's not the critical part of the case, but I'm in the room doing the timeout, even though I don't believe they in it. They find that acceptable. 
What? Your your hospital finds that acceptable. Yeah, I was there. I mean, what, I mean, just do I have to be there and then stay there and never leave the room till the specimens out? So, as chief of surgery, would you have to put that through your department as a as a, something you'd have to approve as on a department level? So we do not have a rule that the surgeon has to be there. You, the surgeon has to have seen the patient prior to surgery. Our hospital rule is you don't have to be there for the timeout. The timeout has to happen, but you don't have to have the attending presence. So that's a hospital. That's not a CMS rule, I don't believe. I, I, the, um, uh, and again, I have very strong feelings on the timeout uh, and the inadequacies of it. Well, we're out of time. I appreciate um, uh, all of your attention and it's brought up a lot of great questions. And uh, thank you again. Thanks, guys.